As you can see from these songs that we're singing, we are a cross-shaped people. We are a cross-oriented people. We bring all of our burdens and cares uh, and all of the ways that the accuser, the diabolos, the, the one who accuses us, the one who uh, tears us down and tempts us to sin and then smears our face in it, we come here this morning looking to the cross. We look to Christ, our Redeemer. We come as people who are forgiven through God's grace, through the blood of Christ. And so as we've talked about with God's holy law, we recognize that there is one who has fulfilled the law in his deeds and in his death. And so we're here this morning to celebrate him and to, to recognize that God accepts us in Jesus Christ, and he calls us to a new life empowered by his spirit. If you would go with me in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 25, today we are in verses 1 to 9, just those first nine verses of Exodus 25. Today we enter into a new section in the book of Exodus that is focused on the tabernacle, this may be something you're familiar with. It could be something you've never even heard of. Uh, if you're just visiting with us today or maybe um, you're a child here and, and you just you haven't really heard of this thing called the tabernacle. You know, you take for granted sometimes if you've grown up in church that uh, things like justification and circumcision and tabernacle and so forth, uh, these words that really just kind of come out of the Bible and you don't hear them in everyday life. You, you don't encounter them really in uh, day-to-day life and you just take for granted that it's clear what these ideas are. But uh, maybe uh, today that's not a familiar category to you and I hope that you will uh, stick around and go through uh, the remainder of this. But we are Uh, Moving into the tabernacle, God's dwelling place among the Israelites, the central place of worship and sacrifice. So for several months now, our focus has been on the law. But as we've seen, the law is about covenant. So when we come through, when we go through Exodus and we come up to these, all of these legal passages, the Ten Commandments and the book of the covenant that follows, we are meant to center our thinking on covenant. The law constitutes the terms of the covenant. God is forming a relationship with his people. And that is really the focus. As we read God's law, as we center on this notion of covenant, our minds should immediately go to this notion of relationship, that God forms a relationship with his people. And we saw this last week with the confirmation of the covenant and the covenant meal, that beautiful image of Aaron and his two oldest sons and Moses and 70 of the elders of the people gathered halfway up the mountain before the Lord. They see God and they eat and drink in his presence. And it brings us back, I think, many moments before that point in Exodus, but it makes me think of the picture in Genesis 18 with the three men that come to Abraham's tent. One of them is the Lord. And there we see Abraham preparing a meal and eating there with these three. This this picture of relationship, of the connection that exists between God and his people. And here, with the tabernacle, this emphasis on relationship comes even more clearly into view. So if the relationship with God is clearly in view in the covenant and in the giving of the law, how much more does it come into view as we look at the tabernacle? God wills that his people know him, that his people walk with him and be with him. In his grace, God comes to us, dwells with us, and he joins himself to us. And so for those of us here this morning who are Christians, we recognize that we have been joined to God through Christ, uh, that we know God, we have a relationship with God. We've been made his children. And so we recognize that the great emphasis of the Bible on having a relationship with the Lord. Now you may be thinking, as we come to this large section on the tabernacle, that essentially takes up the rest of the book. So, So you better buckle in because this is where we're at until the end. Uh, there's, 
There's the, the situation with the golden calf, and that is actually folded in, really, to uh, the opposite. It's meant to be a contrast as we get the instructions for the tabernacle. And then after the golden calf incident, we get the implementation of the tabernacle. And between the two, we get this false worship. So God lays out true worship, and then we get this instance of false worship. So really, everything from this point forward focuses on the tabernacle. And you may be thinking, as we come to this large section, that this is some tedious material tacked onto the end of the book. And if you've read through Exodus, you, you may get that impression, if you're just reading it quickly, all of these details, all of this minutia. It's just tedious material tacked onto the end of the book, an instruction manual dealing with building practicalities. Yes, the plagues. Yes, the Red Sea. Yes, the Ten Commandments. But then acacia wood and poles and loops and all of this stuff. You know, what, 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 what? Let's get to something better. You may be thinking as you're going through the end of the book of Exodus. But we need to understand that the tabernacle is actually the climax of the book of Exodus. Now, all along, we've seen some amazing things. We've seen the amazing plagues that God brought on the Egyptians, the faithfulness and the, the, the rescue of the Israelites in the Passover. We've seen the parting of the sea. We've seen God show up on Mount Sinai. We've seen some incredible things. So it really does boggle our minds to think that the climax of the book of Exodus is this tabernacle. It's the climax of everything we've seen so far. The plagues, the exodus, the sea parting, the miraculous provisions in the wilderness, the glory at Sinai, the giving of the law. The tabernacle is the climax of all of it. We know that God will bring his people into the promised land, into Canaan, and that's where this story is headed. We know that uh, we would think of that as the climax, that we're, we're moving from Egypt into Canaan. But God is not merely in the transporting business. That's not what God is about. That's not what we are meant to understand. He is not merely in the business of giving his people a ride from slavery in Egypt to prosperity in Canaan. God has a much greater a much deeper agenda than that. Remember the words that God gave to Abraham back in Genesis chapter 17, in verses 7 to 8. Listen to the emphasis that the Lord has as he gives these covenantal words to Abraham. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. Did you hear that? To be God to you and to your offspring after you. And then he goes on. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. But then listen to what he says after that. And I will be their God. That's the climax. The presence of God the glory of God, the worship of God, these are the climactic themes that fill this latter section of Exodus. These are the wondrous, dramatic, incredible themes that should fill our minds even as we're sort of dusting off little bits of, little items, the materials of the tabernacle, even as we're digging down into the weeds, plucking these little flowers. These are the great themes that should be filling our minds every week as we go through the tabernacle, the presence of God, the glory of God, and the worship of God. One commentator, Walter Kaiser, says this as he reflects on the structure and content of Exodus, and particularly in the latter section. He says this, the sheer amount of text devoted to the topic of worship ought to demonstrate its importance. And that's what we need to recognize is that really this is about worship. Now, this is not about constructing a thing. This is not about gathering things. This is not about amassing stuff and creating something. This is about the worship of the living God. 
And for that reason, as we go through the tabernacle, this section has the effect, or it should have the effect, of elevating our worship. The way we approach God, the way we think about delighting in him and magnifying him in our private lives, in our families, and it in our corporate life together as a church, in our private worship, in our family worship, and in our corporate worship, in all of life, a passage like this, a section like this, should elevate our worship, our view of God's holiness, our enjoyment of his presence. That's what the tabernacle is about. The title for the sermon this morning is Introducing the Tabernacle. You'll see it up there on the screen. And if you would go ahead and stand with me as we read God's word together, we're gonna read Exodus 25, verses one to nine. Introducing the tabernacle. This is the word of God. By the way, uh, all these little details and all that we're gonna read, this is part of God's inspired scripture, which is profitable for us in fully equipping us for every good work. Verse 1, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the people of Israel that they take from me a contribution. From every man whose heart moves him, you shall receive the contribution for me. And this is the contribution that you shall receive from them, gold, silver, and bronze, blue and purple and scarlet yarns, and fine twined linen, goat's hair, tanned ram skins, goat skins, acacia wood, oil for the lamps, spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense, onyx stones and stones for setting, for the ephod and for the breastpiece. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst, exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and of all its furniture, so you shall make it. You can go ahead and be seated. This is God's holy word. Let's pray and ask for his blessing over this time of instruction that he would illuminate his word, that he would prick our hearts and apply his word to our hearts in the way that only he can do that he would be gracious to us and merciful to us this morning in this time not being in vain, but that his spirit would take hold of our lives in a greater way, in a more practical, everyday way uh, as a result of our being here this morning. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you guide us in all things and you are with us, Lord. You're faithful. And we pray this morning that our hearts would uh, see clearly, more clearly who you are, that we would, we would worship you as a result of this time together. We pray that our uh, desire to please you, to serve you, to glorify you would grow. God, that our hatred of sin and our, our, our ability to see it in our own hearts would, would grow. We pray that our effectiveness and our fruitfulness for your glory would grow. God, we thank you that You're so kind to us, and you've brought us here this morning to sit under your word. You've brought us here this morning to sing your praises, to pray to you together as a people. You've brought us this morning not to just commune with you individually, but to be together with our brothers and sisters in Christ, to be a family together with you as our Father, Jesus Christ, our Lord and King, as our elder brother, and all of us as brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, we're thankful for the time together, and we pray that you would be glorified and that we would be edified, and we pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. So our passage for today is introductory, and you can see that as you go down below verse 9, the Ark of the Covenant, the Table of the Bread, the Golden Lampstand, the Tabernacle, and so on and so forth. So you see the various parts are going to be coming out of this. So this is introductory. It introduces the tabernacle before getting into all of the particulars. And this morning we're going to look at two things, and these are the two big instructions that Yahweh gives Moses. <clears throat> the two big instructions coming from the Lord to Moses that he is then to deliver to the people when he comes down off of the mountain. So here they are, uh, simply just coming right out of the text, the contribution, verses 1 to 7, and the construction of 
verses 8 to 9. So we see two big verbs here. Verse 2, that they take for me a contribution. And then in verse 8, let them make me a sanctuary. So the taking of the contribution is the first part of the passage. And the making of the sanctuary is the second part. So the contribution and the construction. So let's look first at the contribution, verses 1 to 7. So go back, go there with me again as we read those again. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the people of Israel that they take for me a contribution. From every man whose heart moves him, you shall receive the contribution for me. And this is the contribution that you shall receive from them. Gold, Silver and bronze, blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen, goat's hair, tanned ram skins, goat skins, acacia wood, oil for the lamp, spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense, onyx stones and stones for setting for the ephod and for the breastpiece. Well, here we are again. Moses is on the mountain with the Lord receiving instructions. We seem to be there a lot. And as we talked about last week, the emphasis uh, throughout Exodus is on the mediator. And we see that in Deuteronomy 18, as I've said recently, that uh, Moses talks about one who's going to come, who uh, who is going to mediate. Now, he's called there the prophet, but we see other places where he's emphasized as the king or the priest. So Jesus Christ, the prophet, priest, and king, is always in view as we see these mediators in the Old Testament interceding for the people with the Lord. But here he is again on the mountain with the Lord. We saw this with the law, and now we get it with the tabernacle. And I think there's a little implication for us here. As we see Moses, aside from the mediator, as we see Moses there on the mountain with the Lord, and it reminds us of this as we think about Christian leadership. And let's specifically say leadership within the church. Christian leaders are conveyors. We are conveyors. Not innovators, but conveyors. Moses' job is to bring the word of the Lord to the people. Yahweh speaks, and Moses conveys that to the people. And insofar as any of us within this congregation leads. That ought to be our objective, is that we bring God's word, not our personalities, not our life experiences and skills and wisdom. All of that God uses. He he folds that in. But our job is to convey God's truth to his people because he's the shepherd. He is the shepherd. Christian leaders are conveyors. And I think we see that in the role that Moses has among the people. And God's first instruction to Moses is that an offering be taken up, a contribution for the people. This is the first instruction. It is by means of this contribution that God will build his holy place, his dwelling place, the place of worship and sacrifice. This is the necessary first step before any building, any constructing gets into motion, this is the necessary first step that will ultimately lead to the climax that we read in chapter 40, verses 33 to 34. So if you're wondering where we're going here in chapter 25 and following, you have to look all the way to chapter 40. In fact, we've got chapter 40 up there on that poster. But chapter 40, verses 33 to 34... So Moses finished the work. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. That's where we're going. That's where all of this is going. The work completed, and the glory of the Lord fills the tabernacle. And of course, all of that has to be traced back to this contribution, this gathering of materials. So as we look at this contribution, there are three things that we need to notice. So you can write these down if you would like, if you're taking notes. And I would encourage the kids, if you're, if you're taking notes, to at least write down the two main points and then any big ideas that come up. But when you get little points within the points like this, it would be a good idea to write those down as well. So three things that we need to notice here about this contribution. It is willful, it is worshipful, 
and it is grateful. And I would fold into grateful purposeful. We'll talk about that uh, in a moment. But first, it is willful. Notice the language used in verse 2. From every man whose heart moves him, you shall receive the contribution for me. We know that the Lord is not squeamish at all about giving commands to his people. Uh, He's done that plenty. Uh, We've had plenty of commands, but here we're told that from every man whose heart moves him, you shall receive the contribution for me. God has need of nothing. He needs nothing. There is nothing that the Lord lacks, and there is nothing that he can't do or make. There's nothing he can't create or produce. God is omnipotent, not impotent. He is the sovereign Supreme, infinite creator of all things visible and invisible. God doesn't need any of us to carry out his work. God doesn't need any of us to move his kingdom forward. But he chooses to carry out his work through his people. (laughs) People like us. He chooses to carry out his majestic, glorious work through us. What a marvel and what an honor that the omnipotent God uses our puny efforts and our puny gifts to carry out his purposes in the world. That's just something to just sit and marvel at. But he doesn't just carry out his work through his people. He doesn't just carry out his work through his people. He carries it out through willing hearts within his people, hearts bent towards him, hearts that are joyfully directed to him, hearts that want to serve him, hearts that want to give to him. God is the Lord of hearts. He's not just the Lord of warm, moving bodies. He is the Lord of human hearts. And that's what we find here. This contribution is to be voluntary. The God in the glory cloud on Mount Sinai is at work in human hearts. And that's an incredible thing to consider is that here we see the Lord making himself known there on the mountain. And the people are looking up and it's like a consuming fire up there. And yet Moses is walking into it, walking in to this glory cloud. There he is on Mount Sinai and yet there he is working in the human heart to million or more people, and there is the Lord, the God of human hearts. He calls his people to give to him cheerfully from the heart, from every man whose heart moves him. And as it says later in chapter 35, verses 21 to 22, everyone whose heart stirred him and everyone whose spirit moved him, all who were of a willing heart. Let me say this to us very clearly. God doesn't need our money. He wants our hearts. God doesn't need even large sums of money. He needs nothing. He owns it all. The only reason any of us has a dollar is because of God. It's because of God's grace, his faithfulness, his providence. It went this way when it could have gone that way. I stayed on instead of getting fired. I was able to to be cured rather than being sick and debilitated. Every single thing we have is from God. He doesn't need anything from us. He wants our hearts. He wants our will. This is the sort of language that Paul uses in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Each one must give cheerfully as he has decided in his heart, not under compulsion, but freely, as unto the Lord. But in case you're thinking, and you might be thinking this, well, if I'm not all that cheerful about it, I shouldn't give. A loophole. We love 
loopholes. In our sinful nature, we love that sort of thing. That's, we, we, we spot those things. We find those things. Well, if I'm not cheerful, I guess I should not give. But if that's your response to that, look at the warning that precedes that verse by Paul in 2 Corinthians 9. you got to go back to verse 6. It's a warning verse. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. And then you get the verse after the, after the verse I just read. Verse 8, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. So let me say this to you. The answer to cheerless giving is not not giving, right? It's not the answer. Well, I don't feel very willful. It doesn't feel very voluntary. It doesn't feel very cheerful. I'll just wait until I'm cheerful. The answer to not being cheerful is not not giving. It is seeking a willing heart from the Lord. That's the answer. So if you find yourself not being joyful or or willful or cheerful in your giving, that's where we need to seek God's grace that he would put that in our hearts, that he would work that into our hearts. And that as we pray and ask him, Lord, make me more like this, that we would do the things and pray the things and give the things that are necessary in order for us to grow in that way. God answers our prayers. We just often don't like the answer. We ask God for things, but we want something different than what he provides. Seek the Lord and ask him to give you a willing heart to give to him. And we read later that this was not a problem for the Israelites. God had worked abundantly in their hearts. And so the craftsmen say to Moses later when we get the the building of the tabernacle, these are all the instructions given on the mountain to Moses. Uh, After the golden calf incident, we'll get a description of it actually being built. And when we come to that latter section, The craftsmen say this to Moses in chapter 36, verse 5. The people bring much more than enough for doing the work that the Lord has commanded us to do. Gold stacked up, stone stacked up, wood stacked up. Just too much. Just take it back. We don't need it. The Lord will work this graciously into the hearts of his people. So the first thing we see about this contribution is that it is willful. The second thing we need to see, and this follows on the first, is that this contribution is worshipful. And very closely related, but I'll I'll explain in a moment what I'm getting at here. Here I simply want to observe this prepositional phrase in verse 2. Notice it, that they take, here it is, for me a contribution. That they take for me a contribution. This is the Lord speaking to Moses. And we see this idea repeated at the end of the verse as well. You shall receive the contribution for me. So twice at the very beginning, the Lord, the Lord didn't have to say it that way. He just take a contribution. But he says it twice. The contribution for me. And then at the end of the verse, my contribution, the contribution for me. Listen to this, all of our giving, all of our giving and all of our doing is for the Lord. There has to always be the right prepositional phrase in all of our giving and doing for the Lord. And here there are admittedly many traps, many traps, giving merely to please others. We do that. Giving to promote self, one's own reputation, or image, or status. We do that. Giving for our own sense of self-satisfaction just makes us feel really good. Makes us feel stable. Makes us feel right. Makes us feel good. There are many pitfalls when it comes to our giving. 
There are many ways that we can give wrongly. And remember this. On the day of judgment, when we stand before the Lord, all will be revealed. Christ's blood will cover us and we will be redeemed. We will be saved, but we will stand before Christ. Read Romans 14, read 1 Corinthians 3, and many other passages. We will stand before Christ. We will give an account for our lives. What will that day say about your giving? The truth of it. There are many ways that we can give wrongly. The giving that the Lord calls for here is worshipful, meaning this, that it has one terminus. The giving that God calls us to has one terminus. It has one ending point, and that is the living God. And specifically, the worship of that God. His praises, his renown, his magnification, his glory, we're just wrapped up in that. And all of our giving and all of our doing bent toward that end. Once again, we need his grace. God makes our hearts this way. God works this into our hearts. But once again, we have to seek him. Once again, when we pray for that, are we willing to do what the Lord calls us to do out of that prayer? This is what the Lord calls his people to. Willful and worshipful, God-oriented, God-centered giving. Third, It is to be grateful as we think about this contribution. It is to be grateful. In verses 3 to 7, we get a description of the various goods, materials, resources that are to be donated and collected. (coughs) So look at those verses. Verses 3 to 7. We have metals, gold, silver, and bronze. We have yarns colored with expensive dyes, blue, purple, and scarlet, whether from a shellfish or a snail. You would have to get so many of these in order to get this very expensive, costly, beautiful dye that would dye these fabrics and not fade. We have linen, hair, and skins, fine twine linen, goat's hair, tanned ram skins, goat skins. And this word goat skins is possibly, you'll see a note in the ESV, it's possibly a dolphin skins, or some sort of seal-like animal. There is wood, oil, and spices. Acacia wood, oil for the lamp, spices for the anointing oil, and for the fragrant incense. And finally, precious stones. So we have onyx stones and stones for setting, for the ephod and for the breastpiece. Now, we will encounter these items in detail as we go through the tabernacle instructions. We're going to see all these things. I'm not going to go into great detail about these items because we're going to actually see the way in which these items will be used as we go through all of this material that's coming up. But for now, I want you to at least see the finished product or what's in view. And so we've got this picture here. Now, this came from the ESV Study Bible, uh, but we, we, we got it, a, a digital version of it, and we shortened the descriptions just so you would be able to see what's there. But this is the finished product. This is what's going to come and what God's glory is going to fill as we come to Exodus 40. So as you think about this structure, these structures and these furnishings, now this is what all of this material is, is going to be for. We see the most holy place and the holy place and the veil. And, of course, there's two veils and the fine twined linen curtains, the bronze altar, the gated courtyard entrance, the bronze basin, and the tabernacle tent. And, of course, all of the wood structuring that goes into the whole thing. But here's the point that I'm getting at at this stage. Where did the Israelites get all this stuff, Right? So they have all this stuff. They're just pulling out the gold, stacking it up. You know, they were slaves. This is a slave people wandering through the wilderness. Where are they going to get all this expensive dye? Where are they going to get uh, these, these possibly dolphin skins to waterproof the tabernacle tent? Where are they going to get gold and silver? Where did they get all this stuff? Well, we have to go back into the earlier narrative of Exodus to find that, Exodus chapter 3. And although all of these things aren't mentioned, I think most, if not all of these things, came from Egypt. 
Exodus chapter 3, verse 22. This is what the Lord tells Moses at the burning bush. But each woman shall ask of her neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing, you shall put them on your sons and your daughters. So you shall plunder the Egyptians. When the Israelites leave Egypt, they are, they are absolutely rich. And it's like they plundered the Egyptians. It's as though they went into Egypt, they waged massive war on this people and carried off all of the goods singing and dancing out of Egypt. But they did none of that, of course, because the Lord simply, through his glory and power and his working in the hearts of the Egyptians, had it to where the Egyptians were just like, here, take this, take this, take this, take this, take this. No begging. No slashing or killing. No plundering. Just simply leaving with all these donations. And then Exodus chapter 12, verses 35 to 36, the people of Israel had also done as Moses told them, for they had asked the Egyptians for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing, and the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have what they asked, thus they plundered the Egyptians. Incredible scene with these uh, Israelites leaving Egypt with these children, these slave children decked out in purple and scarlet robes and different kinds of clothing. I mean, just hanging off of the people. Everything, and here's the point that I want you to see. Everything the people had, had come from the Lord. Everything. And not just generally. I'm not just saying that in general. You know, we know that every, everything we have is from the Lord. Everything they had is from the Lord, right? We know that. We just talked about that. But I'm talking specifically Everything that the people had had come from the Lord largely, if not entirely, in the event of the exodus, in this great act of plundering caused by the Lord. And now they were being asked to gratefully give it back to the Lord as an offering. Everything they had had from the Lord stamp on it. By the way, let me just ask you that. Does everything you have have a from the Lord stamp on it? Do you see it that way? It's got that stamp, and it's not kind of off to the side like expiration dates on cheese and other stuff where you got to look for it for like five minutes. I'm talking about it's stamped on it loudly, dark black ink from the Lord. Everything we have stamped from the Lord. They were being asked to give it back. Well, it's from you, God. Yeah, here you go. It was never mine. It was never truly mine. Oh, how many things are mine in this life? Mine. It's always the Lord's. It's from the Lord and it's back to him. Always. There's an implication here for us to consider. And think about this. God's good gifts are always purposeful. And consider that, you know, we don't think that way. We're just bathing in our stuff, bathing in our experiences. And we tend to think that it really is just about our personal fulfillment. I mean, that's, that's what it is for. And, and we know that's not the church answer. I mean, we don't say that in Bible study, of course. But what's here? What's going on in our minds? We, we live as though it really is about our personal fulfillment. Thank you, Lord. Just holding it all tight and close. What we need to understand, and I think what this shows us, is that God's goods, good gifts are always purposeful. God gave all those things to the people for a reason. It had a purpose. It had the purpose of God's praises. It had the purpose of God's dwelling, his worship. That's the reason they had all that stuff. They are given to be used for his praises. You know, we're going to give an account to the Lord for everything he gives us. This is the parable of the talents. Everything we have that we milk for our own pleasures and think nothing of God's glory, we're going to give an account to the Lord for all of it. 
because it's all talents given. It's all given to us. You, you remember the man, he got five talents and he went and invested it and he doubled it. The man with two talents and he doubled it. And then the man with one talent, he went and hid it in the ground. Brought it back later. I still have it. What are we doing? What are we doing as Americans in the 21st century with all this largesse, with all this excess? What are we doing with it all? Just swimming in it. The Lord calls us to use it for his glorious purposes, for his praises. So that's first, the contribution. Secondly, <coughs> we come to the construction in verses 8 to 9. So look with me there, please. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. Exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and of all its furniture, so you shall make it. This is a short little section, just two verses, but it is packed with meaning. God's first big instruction is to take a contribution. His second instruction is to construct a sanctuary. So first they are to take, second they are to make. These are the two big instructions that the Lord gives Moses. All the little instructions, all the particulars, all the precise things that are to be done are under these two big headings. Take and make. Take the contribution and make this sanctuary. To put all those materials just mentioned to good use. The gold is not meant to sit in the corner. All those fine dyes just sitting there. Nope. Therefore, a purpose. The word sanctuary means a holy place. And why is this place to be holy, to be set apart, or to be special? It is because this is where God will dwell in their midst. That's what the text says here. Will dwell, I will dwell in their midst. The omnipresent God, so somebody asks you, where is God? Well, there are various ways to answer that question. If a child would have asked their father in ancient Israel, well, where is the Lord? Where is Yahweh, Daddy? Then one way to say that, and the ultimate way to say that, is that he is everywhere. He is omnipresent. But this God has chosen to locate himself in this dwelling place, just as he has chosen to locate himself in the heavens. And we, we, we don't understand that fully. Well, we don't understand that really at all. Uh, what, what, how that is happening with angelic beings and so forth and Gabriel being sent from the Lord and angels around the throne of God and so forth. But God has located himself here, as we read, in this dwelling place to be found here, to be approached here, to give mercy and provide atonement here. God dwelling with his people. This is the climax of Exodus. This is what Exodus is leaning towards. This is what Exodus is all about. This is the center and the climax. And we will have much to, more to say about this theme as we travel through the remaining chapters of the book. And of course, the Ark of the Covenant comes up next. You think about God dwelling there in the most holy place uh, where the Ark of the Covenant is. So we'll have much more to say about this theme, but this is the climax of Exodus. God dwelling with his people. In addition to God's presence, which is the emphasis of verse 8, <clears throat> we see God's design in verse 9. Exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and of all its furniture, so you shall make it. You notice the language there? Exactly as I show you, you shall make it. Approaching the Lord will not be a matter of creativity and freedom of expression. This is the glory of our age, right? Freedom of expression. Personal expression and personal satisfaction. That's the God of our age. Well, that is not what the Lord is about. 
That's not what the Lord is about here. It is not a matter of creativity and freedom of expression, but rather a matter of obedience to divine revelation. God lays it out, and his people are to obey. No tweaks. No tweaks. No creativity. Well, I, like, I kind of like the look of this better. There are no design teams for the tabernacle. No, we have design team, and that's perfectly fine. But there were no design teams for the tabernacle. It was laid out precisely. Now, we know there were craftsmen, there were all kinds of specialists and, and others who are given by God's grace the ability to do this, but they are following instructions, not winging it as they go. Now, we don't have a tabernacle, and we'll talk about that a little moment in a moment with the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have a tabernacle and so we're not to think of, let me just say this, because this needs to be said, I think, uh, especially if you've been in church your whole life. This is not, properly speaking, a sanctuary. Uh, I don't like to call it a sanctuary. I'm not saying no, you don't call it. I mean, call it whatever you want to call it. But I, I'm, not, I'm not a fan of calling it a sanctuary because this is not that. This is not uh, the holy place any more than the holy place would be out there in the field if we had church out there or anywhere else for that matter. So we're not to think of the church. We're not to transition the tabernacle over to the church building. This is a meeting house. This is an assembling place. The church is the people. We worship here. I like to call it a worship area or worship space. Call it a sanctuary if you wish. But So we don't have a tabernacle. But here's the point I want to get at. God tells his people how to worship. That's the big idea. God tells his people how to worship. Whether you are living in ancient Israel or in the wilderness moving with ancient Israel uh, 3,500 years ago, or you're sitting here this morning, God tells his people how to worship. And our job is to follow him. And let me just say this. What is worship without obedience? All of these seeker-sensitive churches just trying to figure out how they can reach people with all these innovative strategies and these cool things going on, pop, pop, and these gimmicks in their worship service. It's, it's all about, so they say, reaching people for the glory of God. Well, how about this? Let's just start with obedience. Let's just start with obeying God. What is to happen when we gather for worship? Let's read God's word. And not do zip lines and fog machines. Let's read God's word and see what does God want us to do. He wants us to sing his praises and to read his word. To confess our sins. He wants us to have instruction from the Bible. These are the things that God lays out in his word. Tried and tested for two millennia. And longer than that if you go into the Old Testament. God tells his people how to worship. And, and, and so what is worship without obedience anyway? Right, it's not worship. It's not worship without obedience. The people are to construct the tabernacle in a very specific way with no deviations. And God tells Moses that this is in accordance with a pattern. So that's the reason why. It's not just that God is being a stickler. It's that there is a pattern there's a pattern that is shown to Moses on the mountain. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5, as we come into the New Covenant, explains this. They serve a copy, talking about what, what happens in the sacrificial system, in the tabernacle, and the temple of the Old Testament. They serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. What is the pattern? It's what's going on in heaven. It's what's going on in heaven. This earthly instruction is meant to safeguard heavenly realities. It is important that every piece be as God says it is, so that the pattern of worship in heaven comes through to the people. God gives Moses a pattern to follow, and the earthly tent is to convey the truth of that pattern. As we finish up this morning, as we lean into the tabernacle, 
the most important thing we need to see is that this tabernacle is one big pointer to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, one of the things that some have done, and this is a big debate on this with all the little details, is people try to find, like, correspond all these little details to Christ. And some of that is fanciful, okay? Some of that happens within the church. People, popular level books get written, and it's like people just making stuff up. You know, well, the, the word red appears here, and so this must, and, and we see that this, the shape of this is similar to the shape here. And some of that's helpful. We can explore that and think through that, but some of that is just fanciful. It's just made up as people go. So we want to be careful not to do that. My intention is not to do that as we go through the tabernacle. But what we need to understand is that the tabernacle as a whole with, with all of its parts and much of which we don't understand, and some commentators have pointed out, look, we don't even really know precisely what the tabernacle looked like because from reading the scriptures, we're not able just in our own minds to perfectly put this together today. They were able to do that then, but we're not able today in our time to be precise and specific with regard to how it exactly looked. And so these are reconstructions, right? Not photos. Nobody's back there taking a picture of the tabernacle. They're reconstructions. So we have to be careful in the extent to which we tie all of these things to that deeper significance. But the one thing we must see are these large pointers to Jesus Christ. And I want to give you three of them. Three of them that come just from today's passage. Just from today. First, God's presence. God is making a tabernacle to dwell in. John chapter 1, verse 14 says this about the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, or tabernacled among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. In other words, what are we reading here? We're reading the same thing we do in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, that he is Emmanuel, God with us. The tabernacle where God dwelled with his people, where God was present with his people, is a pointer to the incarnation of the Son of God, that the eternal word of God through whom he made all things, the one who is God and who, who was with God and who is God, he became flesh. He tabernacled among us. He joined his divine nature to a human nature, soul and body, the God-man. Truly God and truly man. This is what we celebrate at Christmas. This is the core truth we celebrate at Christmas. And if you miss, if you miss all, anything at Christmas, don't miss this. If you're a parent, this is the one thing not to miss with your children. The greatest miracle that ever happened we celebrate at Christmas. And that is when God became man and tabernacled among us. All that we're reading, all these details are pointing us to that that the Lord Jesus Christ came and dwelt with us. Second, we see this idea of the true tabernacle. So we have God's presence through Christ's incarnation. but We also have the true tabernacle. Listen to what Hebrews chapter 9 says about Jesus when he did his atoning work on the cross. Hebrews 9, 11 through 12 says this, But when Christ appeared... As a high priest. So you're reading that in your Jewish mind and you're thinking tabernacle, high priest. And we're going to talk about the clothing of the high priest and we're even going to get the ordination of the priest and all of that. That's coming in Exodus. So that's what's in view there. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places. Not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. This incredible imagery that we just cannot wrap our heads around and cannot understand fully is that Christ enters into the heavenly reality. The pattern that was shown to Moses, Christ enters into the presence of the Father and presents himself and is enthroned forever at the right hand of the majesty on high. 
Hebrews 9 goes on in verse 24, for Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, i.e. the the earthly tabernacle or temple, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. And so as we think about the tabernacle, our minds should immediately go to the presence of God in the person of Christ. And as we think about This earthly dwelling place, we are reminded of the true tabernacle, the pattern that is shown Moses, and Christ himself entered into that, sealing our redemption. And then third, notice the majesty cloaked in the lowly. Would you guys mind putting that that back up on the screen? I'm sorry, I didn't tell you that before. Um, Just to put the the tabernacle. I mean, let's just just be honest. It's, It's just not much. Right? But we're meant to see that. We're meant to say that. I mean, when you go to ancient Egypt and you see some of these glorious structures and these stone marble monuments and these temples, you look at the ziggurats, you know, in in ancient Mesopotamia. You look at uh, these Greek and Roman structures later. But throughout the ancient world, these incredibly impressive, majestic edifices... There it is. That's where it all goes down. That's where the Lord who made all those false worshipers dwells. No matter how brilliantly decorated their temples are, they're dead. Full of nothing. This is a dwelling place of the living God. Humble, lowly, and yet majestic. The dyes and the gold pointing to the majesty. The separation of the holiest place pointing to the majesty. Majestic and yet lowly. And that is a perfect picture of the incarnation of Christ. This tabernacle in all of its majestic lowliness reminds us of Christ. Philippians 2, 6 to 8. Who, speaking of Christ, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. If you had walked up on this and you were an unbeliever in those days, a non-Israelite, you wouldn't think much of it. Not much to look at. If you were living in the first century and you ran into Jesus, not much to look at. but God with us. That's who he is. And that is the reality of the tabernacle. Let's pray. Father, we praise you for your word. We praise you for your presence. We praise you for your glory. We thank you for your dwelling among us in the person of your son. God, we are grateful that you have, in the person of Christ, you have brought near to yourself the race of Adam. That in Christ, the second Adam, you have presented man, humanity, before yourself. And you have embraced and exalted man in the person of Christ. God, we thank you for this majestic lowliness that stands in the face of all human glory, that contradicts all efforts of man to be glorious and great and mighty, that flips the world upside down. Lord, we praise you for your wisdom. We praise you for your might.
We thank you for the gospel. And we pray now as we celebrate this covenant through the gospel that we have entered into, this covenant meal, we pray that you would guide our hearts and that we would be worshipful and grateful, that we would be willful and worshipful and grateful and purposeful in all that we do now. In Jesus' name, amen.